Thanks for coming, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Casey Rooksegger Johnson. She's a wife, mother, spokesperson for the importance of tissue donation, and a Columbine High School shooting survivor. Just let that sink in for a second. Casey has spent nearly two decades coming to terms with the haunting reality of April 20th, 1999. Her journey to healing, the truth, and the wisdom that comes along with navigating PTSD during motherhood, and how others can survive to thrive, are shared within the pages of her new book, Over My Shoulder. Please join me in welcoming Casey. Good morning, I'm so happy to be here and honored to get to talk a little bit about my story. Um, and that really is all it is, it's just a story. And it's not one that as a child I would have signed up for, probably, or even had the courage to choose. Um, I was Lacey Casey when I was little, and I was a really timid, quiet little girl who liked to watch life from the sidelines do gymnastics, ride horses, but really not engage. And you never would have guessed that I would be in front of a crowd one day. Um, I never would have thought that either. I had what most little girls would dream of for a childhood. No worries, no concerns. Um, I had really rambunctious brothers and sisters that entertained me constantly. And um, Life was going great, and I, I dreamed of this Cinderella story where I'd meet Prince Charming and ride away on the white horse and never imagined that my childhood would be preparing me for a very different story. Um, this is what my childhood looked like until high school. And it was my sophomore year in high school when things got dark really fast. Um, I came home from lunch one day to find a message on the machine that something was seriously wrong with my good friend Mark. So I called his house. His older brother answered. I said, what's the matter with Mark? And he told me that Mark was dead. That morning, Mark had hung himself, committed suicide. I fell to my knees. I didn't know how to respond. I was hysterical. How do you just lose a friend that fast? And I fell very quickly into a deep and dark depression. Um, Teenagers aren't equipped to handle these kinds of emotions or these kinds of circumstances. I was confused, I was angry, I was sad. And then it got worse when a month later, Mark's really good guy friend did the same thing. So in one month, two boys from our group of friends had been lost to suicide. And that just sent me over the edge. I really didn't know what to do. I couldn't eat, I couldn't function, I couldn't think straight, I was having visions of these boys, and I was in a lot of trouble. Um, my parents were trying to figure out what to do with me, how to help me. I, of course, wanted nothing to do with them, pushed them away, thought maybe I had this figured out. Clearly, I didn't. And eventually, it got to the point when I really thought the only answer was to do the same thing they'd done, to end my life. That's the only way to escape from this pain and confusion and chaos that felt so out of control to me. But what was weird is I knew I was out of control and I couldn't do anything about it. And so my parents caught wind somehow of my plan to take my own life that Sunday out in their barn at 3 o'clock. I don't know how they got this information, but they did. And in their panic of trying to rescue me, a counselor told them, to act like parents. I hated them for it. They completely took over my life. I was sleeping on the floor in their room. Doors were taken off. I wasn't allowed to lock the door when I went to the bathroom. I wasn't allowed to go to school. My life was completely taken over. But looking back, what happened in that time is that they took the control for me when I couldn't do it for myself. And now, looking back, it was a grand rescue that pulled me back out of this darkness. And that summer, I started to see the light again. I was back on my horse competing nationwide. Um, it's kind of where I found my joy and my healing was at the barn with my horse and with my friends. And that summer, a third boy died. And it was at that point I realized I just needed a new start. I don't want to go back to that school again. I need something fresh. So I moved to Columbine. 
that's where my best friend went to school, so I went to school with her. And it was a great year, but I wasn't super involved at the school because I was so focused on riding my horse and competing to get to the world championships the next summer. So this picture is actually on April 18th of 1999. I was leading Colorado in all the competition to make it to the world show in August for that summer. Life was going great. And then April 20th came. And something as I stepped outside of the house told me to go back in and tell my mom, who is sitting right in front of me, <laughs> tell her that I loved her, which is not something I normally did. So I took that step back, and I yelled, love you, mom. And <laughs> she yelled, love you, Case. And out I went. So the day started normal, like any other day. Excuse me. And around lunchtime is when things changed. Every day, my best friend Lindsay and I would meet at our locker, drive to my parents' house, where my mom would have cookies and sandwiches, waiting for us, totally spoil us. But on this day, I couldn't find Lindsay. So I went to our locker, looked for her, went to her math class, couldn't find her. And as I walked in front of the library, I realized I wasn't going to have time to make it home for lunch that day. So I went into the library for the first time ever of that year. And in this bottom picture on the right, you'll see the black chair up against the window. That's where I sat with a magazine and just started reading a gossip magazine, Killing Time. A few moments later, some shots came from outside. I didn't know they were shots. It was just noises. I looked outside. Nothing caught my eye. But then a couple minutes after that, teachers came running in yelling to get your heads under the tables. There's boys outside with guns. And it was very clear from the panic in her voice that this was real. This was actually happening. So you'll see there the row of computer tables. I ran about 10 feet in front of me from that chair, hid under a computer desk that maybe was as wide as this podium, and pulled a chair in next to me thinking, I've got a really great hiding spot. They're not going to see me here. The shots got closer, louder. We heard them yelling. And I just started to pray for my life. And as they entered the library and started shooting and laughing and yelling at everybody, telling us that this was our day to die, I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach. And I was praying. And all of a sudden, I felt a hand lay on my back. And I thought, nobody can fit in here with me. How, how is this hand here? So I turned around to look. And nobody was there. But the hand was still firmly set on my back. And in that moment, I felt a complete peace come over me. I knew I would be shot. I knew my turn was coming, and I was OK with it. I was prepared. A few minutes later, I turned around to see one of the shooters kneeling down about five or six feet behind me, pointing the gun at the boy who was hiding in the spot next to me. They were so close, I turned away plugged my ears, knowing that I was going to be next. He shot and killed the boy who was hiding behind me, turned the gun on me. I remember hearing the shot, and it came through my shoulder, through the front, through my hand that was plugging my ear, and straight across my neck. And as the shot hit me, I fell forward and saw my arm fall in front of me, and it knocked the wind out of me. And he yelled at me to quit my bitching. I thought he'd shoot me again. So I quit breathing, pretended to be dead, hoping he'd move on. He did. In those moments, when he had gotten farther away and I knew he couldn't see me, I checked out the damage. And I couldn't move my arm. And my neck was swelling, and it felt really difficult to breathe. And at maybe three minutes after that, the shooters went somewhere else. And a boy came to his feet and ho hollered at all of us to get out. It's our time to escape. It was the first time I realized that I couldn't move my arm. I could not get that chair out from beside me. And a boy came over, stopped running for his life to help save mine. He pulled the chair out, pulled me to my feet, and we ran out. And you'll see in this picture of people hiding behind the police car. So we ran behind a police car, waited again. Police car picked me up dropped me off at another spot, picked me up again, and finally dropped me off 
at a triage area in a neighborhood nearby. So this is a picture of me in the triage area waiting for um, the ambulance to come pick me up. And I as I was laying there, an off-duty nurse came to my side and she said, um, you're going straight into surgery. And I asked her, are they gonna cut my arm off? She couldn't tell me no. So I waited, the ambulance came, they loaded me on the gurney, and I don't know how I had this clarity of mind, but when they put me on the gurney, my favorite shoe fell off my left foot. And it was laying there in the grass and I was really concerned and I said, hold on just a minute, <laughs> the shoe, can you please get the shoe? And these people are looking at me like, woman, you, you've got problems way bigger than a shoe. <laughs> so they left the shoe behind. Nonetheless, we were on the way to the hospital where the first time I cried is when my dad walked into the hospital and I felt so badly that he had to see me that way. And I asked him, I said, Daddy, did you see the hole in my arm? And he said, yes. Very calmly, because he didn't want to scare me with how bad I looked. <laughs> um, and then it was really about saving my life initially. And then what are we going to do with a 17-year-old girl who's at risk of being an amputee? Doctors met across the nation, phone calls, trying to figure out how they were going to save my arm and allow me the best chance at a normal life going forward. So here you see the x-ray before it was fixed. And literally, the shotgun slug destroyed my shoulder, turned it into a cloud of dust. And besides amputation, the next best option was suggested by this man, Dr. Ross Wilkins, who was here in Denver, lucky for me. Um, he suggested using an allograft, which is a cadaver bone, something that our family had never heard about. We've heard about organ donation and the life-saving impact of organ donation, but never had we heard that you could use a cadaver bone to replace missing or broken bones. So he suggested this surgery, and this, the surgery went well. You'll see here the cadaver bone that they put in, and then the end result, which looks much better than the cloud that was there before. And as my dad was showing me these x-rays, <laughs> the little monitor on my chest, I had no idea what that was. And I asked him, I said, what is that? What else did they put in me? And he very calmly and seriously looked at me and said, I had them put a tracker inside you. So, <laughs> and I looked at him like, is, is he serious? <laughs> Obviously, that wasn't true, even though he may have liked that to be the case. So the surgery was successful, and I, I got to keep my arm. It didn't have much function. If you can see, this is as high as my arm will raise. But standing here, I look just like anybody else. Um, such a gift. But at the time, I didn't think much about it. I was too sick. I was just surviving. And when you're in the middle of a national tragedy and you're just begging for any light to come in and in sync calls, and you're 17 when I was 17, oh my goodness, cue the glam squad. They washed my hair that day, they put makeup on me, and in sync came for a visit, which now I can say that me and JT go 20 years back and good buds. He doesn't know that, but. Um, it just was a moment of light that our family needed, and so many professional athletes and other celebrities reached out, which just offered some amount of lightness in such a hard time. So I was in the hospital two weeks, and then came this other recovery I never could have expected. Here you see me leaving the hospital looking terrified. I'm facing a wall of reporters who are firing questions at me giving me all this attention I never wanted. I don't, I don't want this attention. I don't know why you're talking to me. I don't want to answer your questions. I don't feel safe going home. And the physical recovery was starting now, but really I was stepping out into the world um, with a brand new normal that I didn't know what to do with. I had a broken mind, a broken body, a broken heart, and I didn't know how to function at all. But I still had the goal of getting back on my horse and getting to that world championship show. Those boys weren't going to steal that from me. So I fought with my surgeon for a long time, many months, to get back on my horse. And trained for a year, and the next summer I made it to the world championship show. Which felt like the first big victory in life since surviving the shooting and the suicides. It was really an exciting time. However, 
After that point, I had to go to college, figure out what I wanted to do. And I really struggled going to school. I struggled to be in society. I had very bad PTSD. Noises would scare me. I couldn't be alone. A car backfiring would make me panic when I was driving. Everything scared me. And I was really just surviving and getting by for many years. Um, then I met this guy. And the light started to come in, like maybe I could have the Cinderella story, even though nothing in the last five or six years had looked like that. He was the Prince Charming. And it was kind of the turning point where he brought this calm. He didn't experience this with our family. And he brought this calm to my life and helped me to step into situations and talk me through them and teach me how to retrain my brain to handle panic attacks and to take the control back from that kind of anxiety. He proposed um, and we were married, which was just a brand new start to life for me. Uh, I was working as a nurse at the time, but two years into my nursing career, the physical impacts were too hard on my shoulder and my surgeon told me I had to quit. And that's the first time I probably felt angry about any of this, is that my identity was wrapped up in being a nurse, giving back the same way the nurses gave to me. And now I couldn't do it because of what these boys had done to me. I was living in pain. I wasn't a mom yet. I didn't know what I was worth what I was going to do with myself. And it was a really hard time for me to figure out what I wanted to do with my life that still felt like such a mess. Well, then we had four kids. And if that doesn't give you a purpose, <laughs> oh my goodness. And it was when we had these kids um, that I started to realize, put myself in my parents' situation. They were just moments away from deciding if I would be the donor. And up to this point, I hadn't really thought about the person who donated the bone that saved my arm, that gives me two arms to wrap around those four babies. Um, so as a parent, I just started thinking about these things and thinking about this life that I'm so blessed to be living. And then I started thinking about, how am I going to send them to school? I, I can't put my kids in a school to have the same thing happen to them that happened to me. And I thought, I'm just going to keep them in these two arms forever and never let them go out anywhere. But that wasn't right. So then I started sharing my story. Because my surgeon, who you see here, who's been a very good friend of mine, asked me to speak at this conference. And I only did it because he saved my arm for me. I don't like being in front of people at the time. And I didn't understand why would anybody want to hear from me. I have a laundry list of bad things that have happened. And I have no perspective to share about it. But I went and I talked in front of a crowd of about 1,000 people. And the response from people after that was so encouraging. It was 13 years after the shooting. I'd had enough time to heal. I'd had enough time to realize how I wanted to let the shooting impact my life going forward. And how in sharing my story, maybe I could encourage somebody else who was going through a hard time, that yes, the battle's hard, the journey's long, but it's so worth it. And beauty can come out of really bad circumstances. So I started sharing my story a little bit, shaking with my speech and being nervous wreck in front of people. And then I started meeting other people who were sharing their stories. And being around them encouraged me that it's in sharing our stories that we find more healing and purpose in the things that we've been through and we get courage from other people who are doing the same thing. And I mean, this man is just one example who's got a, a crazy story and was almost burned alive from an accident. And his courage to share encouraged me to keep sharing mine and finding healing and purpose in my own story. So one of these conferences that I was speaking at, somebody asked me about the bone donation. They said, did the donation save your life? like an organ donor, like an, or, excuse me, an organ donation does. And that question really threw me. Because no, medically, the donation didn't save my life. But what is life? And that's when I started thinking as a mom and that I've got two arms to hold my kids, to walk across the street holding two hands, to hold a book in one hand and a child in the other. And how very different my life would look had I been the 17-year-old amputee. 
that's life. It completely saved my life in a different sense. And the quality of my life and the fullness of my life is much better because of this donation. So then people said, you should write a book. <laughs> I laughed for many years. Again, I didn't understand why people would want to hear from me. I'm not an expert in anything except this life that looks like chaos trying to raise four kids. But the truth is, I have gained a lot of healing in sharing my story. And sadly, events like Columbine keep happening. And there was nobody in my life at the time of Columbine who could tell me, in five years you might feel like this. This is what PTSD feels like. In 10 years, you might feel a little more encouraged. Hey, in 15 years, you're going to be doing great. Nobody could tell us that. And it was a little bit lonely to be the victim of something so big and not have anybody to relate to or to understand. And I wanted to be that for the people who are going through these events or who are suicidal as teenagers. I wanted to encourage them and say, hey, the road is so hard, but it's so worth it. And you can choose to bring beauty out of it. Sometimes it's going to be a daily choice. Sometimes it's going to be a fight, but it's worth it. And so I decided I would write a book. Truly, I had no idea what it would take to write a book. I had this grand idea that I'd sit down, type for a bit, and two years later, there'd be a book. <laughs> That's not the case. It took four and a half years of writing. And um, it was just a really interesting experience for me. It was a completely different way to recount everything I'd been through, but also to hear the stories of my family. And that maybe is the moment that healed me the most in writing, is that for so long people have focused on me and my story because I was the one who was injured. But our whole family was injured. The impacts of Columbine and the year before Columbine trickled throughout my whole family. And so to hear my siblings' stories and to focus on my parents' story and their perspectives brought me a lot of healing in our unity as a family and how we'd really survived. And we didn't just survive, we were thriving. Um, and we look back and realize that each event kind of led to preparation for the next. We handled Columbine so well as a family because the year before was so hard. My parents were just trying to keep me alive. But it made me and my parents and siblings realize, yes, you can survive and you can thrive again. We thrived after the suicide year and we can thrive again after Columbine. It's worth the fight. Um, I'm sorry. So here's my siblings who were so gracious to put their stories into this book and just be vulnerable, again, for other people who are going through hard things and what it looks like from the outside as a family member looking in. And I'm just so grateful for each of them and who they've been to me and how they've encouraged me in owning my story and encouraging me to share. Um, we have a life full of love for sure. And here's the whole family. And I think the picture of this and the smiles on everybody's faces really show, man, we've been through a lot, but that's not what our focus is. Our focus is on life and our focus is on choosing hope and encouragement and um, you know, living out our stories in a way that brings purpose and healing to other people as well. So I've had two realizations that I want to point out in all of this. One, my kids are really cute. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think so. <laughs> They're 11, 9, 6, and 2. Not 2, he's 5. 11, 9, 6, and 5. I think I wish he was still 2. <laughs> it's going so fast. OK, so two realizations. As I was raising these kids and thinking about sending them off to school, I thought, I'm just going to homeschool them. Then they can never get shot at school. Not even an opportunity. But that's not the right reason for choosing to homeschool for me. And I realized I'm making decisions for their childhood based on my fear. And that's not the reason I should be choosing things for my children. I shouldn't be making choices out of fear and impacting their childhood because of experiences that I'd been through. And it came to me after the Sandy Hook shooting. I got in a really bad place after that. 
um, of fear for my own kids. But I realized the boys who did this to me were still controlling my life. And there's a point before the Columbine shooting that they made a video. And in that video, they're looking in the camera as if they're looking right into my eyes, saying, we're going to haunt your nightmares forever. I can still see it. And they were. They were doing exactly that. 13, 15 years after the shooting, they were still controlling my life with that fear and that intention to haunt my life forever. These are four kids they never wanted me to have. And I was done with it. I was done with giving them control. And I wanted to live the life I wanted to live with the kids they never wanted me to have. And I realized, what do I want to do with all this? I want to send my kids out into the world knowing that when they face hard things, they can overcome it. There's hope in it. There's beauty from it. It's going to be hard. Every child's going to go through some hard things. I don't really want them to. I have no idea what their life brings in front of them, but I want to prepare them and be that example for them that you can thrive. It's OK. You can fight hard. There's going to be hard days. Some days you're going to struggle, but it's an opportunity to grow more and to heal on a deeper level and to choose how you want to use the things that other people do to you in your life going forward, not giving the evil intentions control. And the other part about the realization that I had is that anyone can find beauty in the ashes. And we hear these stories, even recently here in Denver, about these shootings that happen. And this last one, what's so amazing to me is that I know the name of the hero. I don't even know the name of the shooter. I, we're focusing now on the heroic stories, and that's where the focus should be. Because that's the beauty that's coming out of these things, and the beauty that's going to spread hope of the goodness of people and the goodness of human nature that encourages other people to live their lives with purpose and with love that trickles out into the community. Sometimes it's a fight to choose the hope, because it's really hard in different areas of grief, but it's so worth it. And even when it's a daily choice, choosing hope over tragedy or grief will always bring much more purpose and meaning to the life going forward. And that is my story. Thank you for having me. question, raise your hand and I'll run the mic. I love questions. <laughs> um, hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I can't tell if this is on. Um, thank you for being here and for being so brave and to your family as well. Um, we are so um, lucky to have you here. Uh, my question to you is, um, it seems like with the coverage of shootings now, a lot of it has become kind of normalized. Like the conversation has been, this just happens. This is a part of life. And even children are starting to think about how they might sacrifice themselves as that boy did in Highlands Ranch. Um, and what is your response to that? Like to this idea that this is normal and that children are internalizing that very and preparing for that very early on. But the idea that this is normal is heartbreaking. Um, when Columbine happened, it was so un, I, nobody was prepared for something like that, right? It rocked the nation. It was in the news for years that Columbine happened. We had support for a long time. It's one of those moments where people remember where they were when Columbine happened. And now these stories come out. They're in the news maybe for a day. <coughs> and the news moves on. But these families, I mean, our family knows and I know how life-shattering these events are. And just because the world moves on doesn't mean that these people who are impacted are able to move on. And there's not the same support. And it's a lonely road. You'll see that's why many of us from Columbine want to welcome these people with open arms to this club that nobody signs up for, because we know what it's like 
and we didn't have people to relate to, and that was a little bit lonely um, and isolating. So we want to make ourselves available to encourage these people through this hard road that everybody else has moved on from, but their life has taken a complete change in direction. We want to help them along the path. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to say this without crying, but how do you teach those children resilience in a time like this? Just coming from what she just said, I have a six-year-old and I'm terrified because it's so normal and it's so real. And this piece of hopelessness that I don't want to eat into her life because it's not fair at her age to teach her to be afraid of what I think is a horrific reality. Um, yeah, I mean, it's something to cry about. It just is. Um, so that's something we've really struggled with as parents with our own kids in telling them my story because we don't want them to know the realities of this world. We don't want them to know what mommy went through and that's, that those things are even possible. So we're, we're very careful with how we package my personal story to each of our kids individually based on their personality and their heart and how they respond to life. Um, I think we're hoping that the example we set as parents to them teaches them the resilience and we, we have this thing in our house called love buckets. That's what we call our hearts, is our love buckets. And I know the fear that you feel because I have felt it. And it's a struggle to not go to that place of fear. Um, but I've realized what can I control as a parent? And what I can control is the time that I have with my kids and what I'm filling their minds and their hearts with. So our kids don't watch the news. We're really careful about TV. We're very intentional about together time. And my goal every morning before my kids leave the house is to fill their love bucket, knowing that when our love buckets are full, that's what's spilling over onto people around us. And it doesn't have to be just a school shooting. What if it's a car accident? What if it's an accident playing on the playground? I, don't, I can't control those things. But what I fill my kids with before they leave my house is what I can control. And letting them know, for me, that hand that was on my back in the library is fully available for each of my children. Does that help? Does anybody else have questions? I think a lot of people that suffer traumatic experiences as a child um, as we grow up, we get a lot of the anger um, because of what happened. How did you dealt with it, or how did you, like, was able to kind of clear it? Um, I haven't dealt with anger a lot. It kind of comes and goes with certain circumstances. Like when I lost my job as a nurse and I couldn't pursue my passion, it made me mad. When I'm facing surgeries and unable to hold my kids, when I'm living in constant pain, it makes me mad. This wasn't something I brought on to myself. But anger is so toxic to our life. And choosing to stay in that state of anger only hurts us. What's it going to do for me or to them for me to be mad at them for what they did to me? It's not productive in my life. And I think my faith has helped me find a purpose in what I've been through, which helps keep the anger at bay, but also the daily choice to not mire in that anger and to choose something greater or something better and more productive for my heart and my mind and my life. Um, what, do you, what do you think needs to change in our schools to prevent students from getting to a place where they commit these That's a hard question, right? <laughs> um, 
I think it goes back to the heart of humanity and the value of life. And the, I mean, you can get a thousand opinions about this and it's just mine. But when you, you're responsible for the way you feel and the way you act out on how you're feeling, but a lot of that is taught to our kids or not taught. I mean, I've got one daughter who acts out irrationally every time she feels anything. It can be the greatest feeling or the worst feeling. And how we rein that in and teach her an appropriate way to convey those emotions or those feelings of whether it's anger or excitement or frustration that she feels. At this stage of our life, that's something we're wanting to teach her going forward, how to cope when it's appropriate and that what we're feeling is not to be put on somebody else. It's ours to handle and then, you know, whether it's recover from or find healthy ways to incorporate into our life. I just think that's a part of it. I don't know how to prevent. People ask me questions about that and I feel like I'm not an expert because I survived a school shooting. I don't know. I don't know why they chose to do this to me or why these kids keep choosing. One thing I love is, like I said, focusing on the heroism and the good stories and not giving these people who are doing this any amount of attention, the negative attention that they're craving, but putting out the positive focus and the positive attention. Yeah, so writing the book, like I said, was really difficult. I wasn't a writer before. Um, and the timing of the book, I think, is important. I could not have written a book five years after Columbine when people told me I should write a book. I don't know what I would have said. Here's all the bad things that happened to me. <laughs> have a great read. I don't, I, I, on a side note, my daughter asks me, is high school fun? <laughs> I tell her, go ask your dad. I don't know why you're talking to me about is high school fun because I am the wrong person to talk to. But that's kind of how it would have felt writing a book five years after. I had no perspective. I had no opportunity. It took 13 to 15 years for me to heal enough and learn how to use the circumstances of my life in a positive way going forward. I would have had nothing to offer five years ago or five years after. So it really took that time and, and starting to open up and share my story, which was scary to me because I'm a very private person in nature. But as I got in front of crowds and shared and realized people were inspired and encouraged by the journey, not really even anything I did, but the journey and perspective of somebody that many years out from an incident, that's why I decided to share the book. And that was the point of sharing the book, is that I don't, I don't want it to be about me, but I have this story, and if this story impacts one life of another victim or somebody else who's struggling with suicide or any kind of grief or trauma, then it's worth it. That's what I want my story from Columbine to be, which is complete opposite of what those boys wanted for my life. So it was like a week ago um, you feel helpless and you don't know like how to help I think we are all in like a really um, people in this room that like work at the company we are we we have um, skills that we can lend but we don't know like how to plug in so um, for people who aren't involved or know the victims directly like what's the recommendation of how to help um. Well, I know one thing for us that was really encouraging is um, we got thousands of gifts and cards, just little notes, 
written to us to encourage us and let us know we're thinking about you. We, my parents still have a room in their house dedicated to all the boxes of things that people sent from around the world. When you're not directly associated with the family, it's hard to jump in, even though we want to, we want to help. Um, the community in Highlands Ranch, I've been in contact with them. They are surrounding these families and doing wonderful things for them, but on the outside, it's spreading the messages of hope and, and honoring the lives of kids like Kendrick, who gave up his life to save other people. And just spreading those sharing, spreading those sharing, spreading, <laughs> sharing those stories of encouragement. And um, I mean, there are, it depends on the circumstance. There are times when they've got set up certain um, ways to help or community events that gather things for people. But it's really about what can you do in your community to spread encouragement and um, gifts and cards are always helpful to, I mean, it's really fun for us to go back even now 20 years later and read through some of the cards that people sent and just from around the world that didn't even know us, but to know that, that they thought about us and they, or they prayed for us. And even if your card isn't read right now, it could be something that's hugely helpful in six months when nobody in the media is paying any attention to these kids or these families and they're feeling completely isolated and alone to know, all right, there's still people rooting us on, you know? Yeah. Anybody else? No? Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me.